welcome everyone tonight and thank you for joining us. Before we do anything else, I do want to uh, congratulate the fact that we have a new chair and a new vice chair. Um, our new chair is uh, Julie Hen, and the new vice chair is Cheryl Pasteur. Um, I also want to thank uh, the former chair, Marquita Scott, for all that she did. I know it was a very tough year. It's a year that hopefully we will never have to go through again and no one ever anticipated, but uh, I just wanted to thank her for her year of service and uh, that we really appreciated all she did. Uh, I also wanted to share with everyone that um, Cheryl Pasteur wrote a very nice email today, apologized for the fact she could not be here, but as we all have happened sometimes, she had a scheduling conflict. So she was sorry she couldn't, but she's anxious to be able to meet with the advisory councils uh, at another time. So I think very much. Um, I would like to now ask Julie Hen, if our chair Julie Hen, excuse me, Madam Chair, if you would please introduce the um, board members that are present tonight. Absolutely. Um, thank you, Ms. Sibley. Um, good evening, everyone. So with us this evening, we have board member Kathleen Causey. We have board member Dr. Aaron Hager. Um, board member Lisa Mack. Board member Lily Rowe. Student board member Christian Thomas. And myself, and I believe that's all we have present. Have I missed anyone? who may be on the phone or otherwise join that I did not acknowledge. No? Okay. Thank you. And thank you. I know this is a very busy time for everyone, and I really appreciate those that were able to fit it into their schedule to uh, come. Uh, Dr. Williams, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Are there any other staff members here with you? Yes, thank you. Um, we all know Tracy Gover, who is the assistant uh, in the board office and the chief of staff is present today tonight. That is uh, Miss Mildred Charlie Green. Thank you and welcome to everyone. Uh, I would like to now hopefully introduce as many of the chairs that are here. I'm going to, um, if you would please Un, turn your screens on and give a wave and I will go through. I'm going to start with the, I know the Southwest chair is here, uh, Marlena Collington Purcell. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. And uh, the chair of the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council, Cliff Collins is here and he has two vice chairs. One is uh, Debbie Hanlon and the other is Aaron Plymouth, and I believe they are both on the call tonight. Welcome. Good evening, everybody, again. And uh, the Southeast chair is Jackie Brewster. Is she, I know, is on, and I believe I also saw Sandy Skardolis, who is the vice chair of the Southeast Council. Yes, I'm here. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this is Jackie and I am here, Donna, and I've received emails from Tiffany and Bash and they are trying to wait for a meeting to start. So they're having problems oh, Somebody needs to had, resolve. OK, they had the same problem I think that Cliff had. I'm not sure. I'm not sure what you did for for Cliff, but maybe. Tracy or Jim, if you could do it for the two of them, that'd be helpful. I'll wait one more minute to see if we can get them in so I can introduce them too.
I think I'm going to go ahead. I don't want to delay much any longer, and when they come in, uh, I will introduce them at that time. Uh, right now, I would like to give a brief overview of uh, the structure of the Area Education Advisory Councils, and I had sent a chart in. I believe Tracy has it that she can put up on the screen. Is the chart there? Jim, can you go ahead and put that up? OK, thank you. In 1976, the board first adopted policy 1230, which created the Area Education Advisory Councils. And at that time, they were structured the same as the administration uh, in five geographic areas. It remained this way for a number of years, and I believe it was about 10 years ago that the administration went to zones and then now we're in communities, four zones and three communities now. But the uh, policy 1230 has not changed and the advisory councils are still structured in the original five geographic areas. When we get to the chart, I did send the chart out with the agenda and the information for tonight's meeting, so you might have already had it. The chart is a chart that indicates what schools are in each area. The schools are in one area only. They are in the area where they physically exist the physical location of that school. Um, the, there it creates a problem when the boundaries of that school, however, overlap several different councilmanic districts. Uh, the elected school board member uh, is also on this chart. And unfortunately, because there are several councilmanic districts that the boundaries include in most of your high schools and a lot of your middle schools, there are stakeholders that are parents of students in those schools. However, they are not actually able to vote for the uh, school board member that represents their school. So it's important for the other uh, school board members that represent the other councilmanic districts to realize that these individuals need to be included if they're not actually in the district where the school is. Um, the example that I am familiar with, and I'm trying to go through and get examples for all the high schools. Um, the example of Towson High School sits in District 5, and we have Chair Julie Hen, who is the um, board member elected to represent that school in District 5. However, the boundaries go into District 2, District 3, and District 5. So all of these stakeholders. And 6, too. And, and, and 6. That, I'm sorry. Thank you, Lily. Um, yes, so it's important that when there's any issues for any of these schools that overlap, that all of those stakeholders are notified or their voices are heard. The other um, problem, I, I, I tell you, when I was looking at the districts, I it I don't know whoever designed the old districts and who knows what's going to happen with this new redistricting, but um, it goes from District 1 to District 4, then to District 2. So in the southwest area, there are two districts that are um, the schools are fall into and that's district one and district four. In the northwest area there are two areas and it's district two and district four and in the central area like I said before it's district two, district three, district five and district six and then in district in northeast rather it's also four districts and 
you end up with um, District 5, District 6, District 7, and one school from District six, uh, 3. And then in the Southeast, it's mostly District 7, but there are a few schools that are in just, there it is, that are in District 6. I also had included at the time the um, community superintendents that represented those schools. Uh, that has changed and will continue to change, uh, but I'm going to speak a little bit more about that going forward. Are there any questions about the chart from anyone? And I can't see any hands, so if anyone has a question, just blurt it out. Was this document mailed to board members? They were sent in. I sent them in when I sent the agenda. I can send them out again. I can definitely, or Tracy does have a copy. Maybe she could send them to everyone. Donna, I'll send it out right now. Thank you so much. Appreciate okay. it. Thank you, because the agenda I saw was attached to board docs, but I, I hadn't seen this before. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks so for mentioning that. Um, one request that we would like to make is that since there are so many different districts that are represented, represented rather, in each of the areas, we would like very much between the elected board members and the at-large board members, if at all possible, if the uh, board could come up with a schedule where there would be one at least one board member present at each of the advisory council meetings. And actually, I think seeing who I'm, who's in the meeting tonight, I think I'm talking to the choir because I know I have seen many of you at the areas I, I've seen. Um, I know Kathleen Causey has been, uh, Lisa Mack. Uh, I'm trying to, th oh, um, Rod McMillian, I think, comes to every one of the Southeast meetings. And I do thank you, Ms. Pasture comes, um, Ms. Jose comes. So I I know that you all are coming and I and we really appreciate it. It's, it's really nice for the members, for the stakeholders, and I think it would be a benefit to the board members also. Uh, it was interesting last night listening to the board meeting. I heard several of you uh, say that you were advocating for bringing some of the board meet members, excuse me, board meetings out to some of the areas. And I, I support that. And I think the area advisory councils would also support that. And if we can help in any way, we are here to help. So thank you very much. Appreciate that. I am um, going to move right along. Did any other members, council members join? Dr. Ferrone, are you in the meeting? Do Donna, he's he must be in the audience. He said he couldn't see, but he can't talk. OK. OK, well, we will continue. Thank Hi, you. Hi, Donna, it's Tiffany. It's the same thing for me. Oh. For whatever reason, I can't sign in. So I can watch, but I can't talk the way I'm talking now. I actually have to call in, so I can't oh, see the screen. Okay. I'm wondering if he could also call in. If he calls in, he should be able to hear and then talk. It's just right. He won't have the visual unless he's in front of the, the laptop. I'm away from the laptop now. Okay. Well, this is the only vision we will have. Okay. So if he can hear, that's that's good. That's fine. Okay. Um, Tiffany, would you like to say anything? I had introduced the chairs. Tiffany Stiff is the chair of the Northeast Area Educational Advisory Committee. Council, rather. No, thank you. That's okay. I'll wait for our turn to okay. we, we have to speak, but I'm here. So. Okay, thank Good you very much. Everyone. Thanks. Uh, I wanted to move forward now. There were several um, concerns, issues, that most of the areas had in common. 
Uh, a lot of them were involving the uh, administration and I had a very delightful meeting and very, um, I thought very productive meeting with Dr. Williams last week. And I would like to now just go over some of the things that we spoke about and give you, um, give the board members an update of what our major concerns were. Uh, we started out uh, in the past, the area councils have met once to twice a year with the um, superintendent. And even the first year that Dr. Williams was here, or the first not first couple of months, he was very gracious and we had uh, met with him too. And then everything happened and that was not has not been the case for almost two years, but he was very agreeable to put that back on his schedule and we are very happy. Uh, it's just an informal meeting where we get a chance to just bring up some concerns we might have that the administration might be able to um, cha not change, but do something about. And also it's a way of us finding out what the visions are going forward so that if there's anything that the advisory councils can do to help, we're always willing to do that. So uh, we're very happy that that will be um, put back on the calendar for hopefully maybe starting in 2022. We'll see about that. Um, the next thing that I had spoken to him about he started talking to me about how he has his staff and he go to the various schools uh, and actually work in the classrooms, spend some time there and really see what is happening day to day with the teachers and the staff. And I was so happy to hear that because one of the problems that we had heard from some of the staff throughout the county is that that's what they were hoping that Dr. Williams would be able to come in, spend some time, not actually as as a um, as a tour and on display, but to be able to sit down and really see what the teachers go through day to day. And he was very very open with how this had really helped not only him but the staff to understand some of the problems that are happening in the schools. And that was a wonderful relief that we were kind of seeing eye to eye on those things. Um, the next concern that I mentioned to him was the fact that we were very concerned when we saw that the position of the community superintendents had been eliminated because that was actually those positions, Dr. Roberts, Christina Byers, and Dr. Jones, they were almost the main contact that we had with the administration. They were almost at, at all the advisory council meetings. And in, in fact, the Southeast actually has a part on their agenda. That's the community superintendent's report. And Dr. Roberts would give a report each meeting as to the different concerns and what was happening in the Southeast schools. Uh, Christina Byers has been wonderful in helping reactivate the Central Area Advisory Council. And uh, Dr. Jones has, I know, been very helpful in the Southwest too. Um, when I voiced this concern to Dr. Williams, he told me not to worry that he does have plans in the new or reorganization and there will be someone that will be there to be able to meet with the advisory councils and um, be kind of a contact person. So I thank him for that. Um, and then you can't really have a meeting with anybody in the board or in the schools nowadays without talking about transportation. So I did bring up a few problems that I see that's affecting the students. Um, I know 
it's a problem all over the country, and I know everyone is trying to work very hard so that we can try to ease the problem that we have. But my problem that I am seeing around is that when the buses are late, the students are more tardy. When the buses don't come, a lot of those students don't have any other means of transportation to get to school. So if they don't get to school, they are marked absent. I asked Dr. Williams if there would be a chance that there could be a different notation on the attendance rolls that would indicate that the students were tardy or absent due to no fault of their own, due to the fact that the bus transportation was a problem. And he said he would definitely look into that, and I really appreciated it. Uh, the other problem sometimes that I have heard, and this is more with um, probably more the high school. Many times when they get there late, the rooms where they can leave their athletic equipment for practice after school or their band equipment, many of those rooms are already locked. They're not available to get into them. Um, they many times have to go and they're already late to class, but they have to spend more time going to the office and that creates more work for the office staff. So we talked about the possibility of um, just making sure I think that it's it's probably just an oversight. Probably people schools don't realize what a problem this can be to the children. So that um, he said he would look into that too. And again, I made a suggestion. I don't know whether this is possible, but the communication with the parents has got to get a little bit better. Um, I would hope that maybe there is someone at each of the bus slots that can notify, can, can see when a bus driver does not show up on time and know that if he's not, if the person is not there, they are not going to be able to be on time with their run and that would be a, there would be a delay. And possibly at that point in time, if it isn't being done, the school could be notified and the parents and the students could be notified a little bit earlier than they are so that they are not already out at the bus stop. Um, I know there are times traffic that that just can't be avoided, but if it can be avoided, it would be very nice if um, that would be the case. Uh, we then moved on to, let me turn the page here and see. Okay, um, there's been a lot of talk about equality. And one subject that has come up is the National Honor Society. National Honor Society is highly recognized honor for any student, particularly when you're applying to college. And when I looked into the requirements that the uh, headquarters give, it says a student must have at least a three point average on a four point scale. A student may apply in the sophomore, junior or senior year. This next sentence is the one that sometimes uh, can muddy the waters. It says that each chapter can make their own requirements. Um, but my question is, is the individual group within a high school a chapter or is the entire district a chapter? Because what I found when I went into the high schools in uh, Baltimore County, there were 11 that actually listed what their grade point average was. There was one that listed it as 3.0. There was one school that listed it as 3.2. There were eight schools that listed as 3.3, and there was one school that listed it as 3.7. I don't think this is equal for every high school student in Baltimore County. And I do feel that we should hopefully look into that. I, I equate it to the fact if there are two students from Baltimore County applying to a college, 
and one maybe is in honor society with the school that had 3.0 um, requirement the others in the school that has a 3.3 3.5 or 3.7 average that person reviewing those application isn't going to know there is a difference but if that kept one child from getting into the honor society we're doing a disservice to that child and uh it was very interesting dr williams said he would um, look into that and in another meeting i was in later on in the week um, i understand that um mr mustafa is has been looking into this for some time so um i look forward to seeing what the result is if there is any result to be done and the last request that I did bring to Dr. Williams, and I'm bringing it to the board because I'm not sure exactly who would be the one to fulfill this request, but I would like to propose that each of the advisory councils be given a BCPS email, not in any one person's name, but in the, could be the initials of like the Southeast SE, AEAC at bcps.org. Um, definitely would be restricted. We would not need to be able to see any staff or any students information. It would just be used for to identify the advisory councils that they are a part of BCPS. They are a formed as um, to a board policy and it would definitely help when the chairs have to go through event manager to book the facilities uh, for using the schools. Right now we have to go in as a community member. We cannot go in as BCPS. So I would like to have that considered. Um, and Dr. Williams also said he would look into that. And I definitely appreciate that. Dr. Williams, would you like to add anything to what was discussed? at our meeting. Well, thank you. Um, uh, your list is accurate, so I appreciate that. Um, um, again, that meeting was last week, and so I have farmed out most of these areas to the appropriate office to explore um, and, and definitely um, the, the one area, and I think um, Ms. Shipley started off with that, that we'll be scheduling a time to have an informal session to talk a little bit about the efficiency review and the understanding of the reorg uh, that we're moving forward. And, and so we happy to sit down and hopefully there'll be some updates by that time based on what we discussed. But no, you hit on every one of those points that we discuss. Thank you so much. And I'm I'm anxious. I'm looking forward to that meeting and thank you for already being on top of things appreciate that very much uh jackie brewster is the chair of the southeast area advisor advisory council and she is now going to be speaking on behalf of the other uh very area education advisory councils on an issue that has affected every area in the county jackie So, so my my question is to the um, to the board members. Um, ju just as a background, al almost all of us served on the my iPass um, um, project, and many of us spent many 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 hours um, attending meetings and um, giving input. And I know some of you were actually in the meetings that that I was in. And our our um, our question really is why the board chose to not follow the recommendations of my iPass. All of us did not get everything we wanted. Many of us made sacrifices, and during our meeting, we we uh, uh, you know agreed and made changes, and we. 
we looked at every single school. I just want you to understand that we went um, in each one of those groups and looked at every single school, listened to everyone's opinion. And um, I think the people that were running the, um, the, the project were very knowledgeable. They could like hone down on neighborhoods. I mean, they were very helpful for us. And I just want an answer from the board why we did not follow the recommendations that were given in my IPASS. I can answer for me, but I can't answer for anyone else. OK. Lily, that's you speaking, correct? Yes. OK, thank you. If you would. So many of you know that prior to being on the board, I was a huge advocate for equitable school facilities and fought to get air conditioning put in all of the schools in the county. When mm -hmm. I started that, we had about 98 that did not have air conditioning, and there was really no plan to do that. And today, after putting temporary vertical package units in the handful that remained, we now have air conditioning in all the schools. And so with that value of meeting all the needs of all communities, the data in my IPASS is very good, but the recommendations were based on available funding. And I fully believe that if the state came up with its share, we could fully fund all of the projects, including the 14 premium projects, and the county executive seems to agree and just issued letters. And I was of that opinion back when we made the decision or when I personally voted. Um, not, I don't wanna downgrade any of the projects from what they actually need. And that is what the recommendations did because the recommendations were based on available funding. And before we do that, I would like to fight for more funding to meet all of the needs everywhere. And this is Julie. I can also speak to that. Thank you, Lily. Um, I was on the board when the system brought a proposal for a limited renovation of Lansdowne, and the board also rejected the limited renovation of Lansdowne. And I voted against that limited renovation for the same reason that I voted um, the way I did for um, Towson and Delaney's recommendations for limited renovations, and that is because it was insufficient to meet their needs. Um, Lansdowne needs a new school. Um, the community spoke out. They, they clearly needed a new school. Um, the experts recommended a new school. What was brought to the board was for limited renovation and the board voted it down. Um, funding was made available for them to receive a replacement school. Um, multiple studies said the same for Delaney and Towson, recommending replacement schools for them as well. When the board received um, feasibility studies for Delaney and Towson, those studies recommended substantially more sig significant replacements than were funded through my IPASS. Um, when the board questioned staff about the differences um, between what was funded in my IPASS versus what the feasibility studies recommended, um, they weren't even close to what was needed or what was recommended in the feasibility studies. So because one community, um, the board, you know, the board said, no, this is not adequate to meet Lansdowne's needs. Um, we're not going to pick and choose favorites. Um, what one community needs, we're going to support that, that community's needs, just like we would Towson, just like we would Delaney, just like we would any school. That's what equity is about, is giving schools what they need. We gave Lansdowne what we needed by voting down a renovation until funding could be um, secured for a new school. And as Lily said, we need to go after funding for replacement schools for Towson and Delaney. And if you look at the rest of the board's capital improvement request, the rest of the request is consistent with my IPASS. Um, those were the only two deviations from the plan. They're significant, but it's what those two schools need. And that's why I voted the way I did. So I hope that helps answer your question. Thank Madam, you. This is Lisa Mack. Um, my answer is similar to both Julie and um, Lily's, but my real 
reason for voting against um, a replacement school for Towson and Delaney is that I did not want to set the precedent that when schools really needed to be replaced, that it was OK to provide a limited renovation. And I thought by voting for those renovations, that was going to be the best that we could do for other schools that also needed to be replaced. Um, I often use the example, my children went, went to the same school that my father-in-law went to, and if he was alive, he would be 102 today. Um, and the school has had no renovations. And at this point in time, it's so old, it wouldn't make sense to renovate it. It would need to be replaced. So those were my reasons. Thank you. Would anyone else like to speak? Any of the other chairs? Hi, this is Kathleen Causey. I'm happy to share Ms. Sibley if I can Thank you. take a moment. Yes. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to share that I have been on the board um, since July of 2015 and I have uh, I got very quickly involved with assessing and evaluating the facilities. Um, and in fact, I um, that's how I met Lily Rowe was we were both at a meeting where parents and teachers <clears throat> and others were very concerned and talking about the lack of air conditioning in so many schools and what that really meant to um, the lack of instruction to unsafe environments. So um, I've been very involved countywide in evaluating uh, what's happening and trying to understand what might be the best solutions. Um, I also agree with a lot of the points that have already been made by um, Lily and uh, Lisa and Julie. Um, and I would just point out that currently um, Towson High School and Delaney High School are the only two high schools identified in multiple um, studies as needing adequate facilities, uh, having uh, serious issues <clears throat> that have not had a, a plan, a full plan, um, much less have that plan implemented. Uh, I also want to dovetail with uh, Madam Chair Hen around the issues with Lansdowne High School. I also uh, supported them being a replacement school after having toured that school multiple times. Um, also, in terms of the uh, feasibility studies that were presented for Towson High School and Delaney High School, where the recommendation was for a renovation, uh, upon my evaluation of those feasibility studies, the reason that the uh, replacement school cost and the life cycle cost was higher was because it had greater square footage. And as uh, Bob Grell, who's the um, uh, director of the Interagency Commission on School Construction had stated in an email to the board, is that that square footage is such a key into the cost, not just of building, but of maintaining. So uh, the fact is, is that uh, if the schools were designed at the same square footage, as the renovations, then in fact, the uh, life cycle costs would have been much lower where that recommendation could have been supported. So that's something where operationally, uh, the school system can look to how they're designing the schools um, and even how they're planning in the feasibility studies. Um, and definitely, as Ms. Rowe pointed out, it's about asking for what we need for every child in every school across this county and not saying that we are going to limit what some schools get based on the funding available at that time, but we're going to ask for what we need. Um, I would point out in January of 2019, we were asked by the county executive at the time uh, because of a financial situation in the government to um, only request a maintenance of effort budget, but the board felt that there were needs that we needed to ask for and when we in fact asked for those needs, we did in fact get $32 million above maintenance of effort and we were able to provide better for our students and staff and families. So I definitely agree we need to ask for what we need for every child and then we need to prioritize and provide the solutions uh, for their children as that money becomes available. Um, so those are just some of the reasons. I mean, it's obviously a very complicated uh, issue with a lot of moving parts. Uh, but I, I definitely have really tried to evaluate and make the best decisions um, 
for the students uh, and the families and the staff, but also uh, being fiscally responsible to the taxpayers with the money that we're provided from the county and the state. Thank, thank you all. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? It really helps when we when we have heard now some of the reasonings that went behind the um, the decisions that were made. And I know that there isn't always time to always do that. And I thank you all for letting us know what your what was behind your decisions. Would anyone else like to? I'm I'm sorry, Donna, but I I really just have to ask. Well, then why wasn't Patapsico worthy of such a decision? I'd happy to be answer that. There was a point in time during the uh, Caminant administration when Woodlawn, Patapsco, um, Delaney, and Lansdowne were all put forward for renovations, and the Lansdowne community and the Delaney community stood up and asked the board to not do the renovations and that they would wait on the uh, capital improvement list until however long it would take for them to get a new school. And the Patapsco and the Woodlawn community did not do that. They decided to take the renovation because they were told by council people, county executive, everyone else that if they didn't take the renovation, it would be 10 years or more before they would get a new school. And I set up Facebook groups at the time. I was not on the board. I was advocating for Lansdowne to get a new school. I was um, not really part of the Delaney push, although the Lansdowne advocates and the Delaney push, Delaney uh, advocates were standing together that we need to meet all the needs in the county. And when I reached out to people in the Woodlawn community and the Patapsco community to see if there were parents and individuals in the community who wanted to um, have a new school, the Facebook groups were set up, but no one joined them. No one came to board meetings and demanded that the board throw out their renovation in favor of a new school. And so there was not the community advocacy I stood up and was very vocal about the fact that I thought Woodlawn and Patapsco should also have a new school because of their facility scores. There's an entire history of those conversations in the BCPS Parents and Teachers for Equitable Facilities Facebook group archive. And it, it wasn't necessarily the decision that a board made so much as it was the county executive made it and no one came and demanded that the board do anything different. That's my understanding of it. If there's other information I'm unaware of, that's the best answer I have. Um, if I can uh, address uh, our, our, our committees as well, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, I just want to thank all of our Area Education Advisory Council chairs for the dedication to the MIAPES recommendations. I want to thank you for dedicating your time to that report. Although it was not approved by the board, um, it did not go to waste. I think it showed us where our true facility needs are in the county, and it really outlined uh, what we need. And I'm I'm proud of the MIFS recommendation, and I think you can review the the board meetings to see uh, where I might have stood on that issue personally. Um, unfortunately, I was not able to vote on that issue as a student member of the board. Um, however, I uphold the decision of the board, and I I, I think that uh, the advocates for uh, the for uh, not following the recommendations and um, you know having two other schools was they, they were strong advocates and they were able to eloquently state um why those schools deserve to be uh, replaced while well, maybe um, instead of giving the renovations uh, so I just wanted to say that the MIFS recommendations did not go to waste and then I really appreciate uh, everyone's dedication in this meeting to that and to our to our capital improvement plan thank you thank you thank you very much Appreciate you joining. Okay. Anyone else? Yes, Miss Sibley, this is Miss Hen. Yes, hi. Uh -huh. I, I just wanted to add a very quick point of clarification, and I know our, we're short on time, so I won't be um, long with this. The board did not vote specifically on the My iPass recommendations. I just wanted to make sure everybody understands that. We voted on our um, state capital request, 
which is built um, based on the system develops it based on the my ipass recommendations and that request there were two modifications made to it and those were the modifications of the line items for towson and delaney high schools um, and those modifications deviated from the my ipass recommendations the remainder of the line items on the state capital request were developed in accordance to the my ipass recommendations so to say that we threw out the my ipass recommendations is not accurate um, the rest of the state capital request was built on those recommendations um, so that work is reflected in the state capital request that the board approved um, the request was amended to reflect Towson and Delaney um, to receive replacement schools. But I, I wanted to make that clear. We amended the request to reflect those two schools receiving um, replacements versus renovations. So it was a modification, not an abandonment, an abandonment of my IPAS, and the board did not vote against the my IPAS recommendations. We didn't vote on them at all. So I just wanted to make sure everyone had a clear understanding of what occurred. Thank you. So Thank I was uh, I, I was responding. Okay. Sorry, Don. I was responding in the chat, and I said it's been said that I should say it because it's an open meeting. But I was told that I really wasn't supposed to be talking in the meeting because only one board, I mean one area advisory council person, should be speaking. But I just oh, want to yeah, I, I know that I, I'm I'm opening it to everyone now. Okay, so Great. I would just like to make it clear that I did speak before the board. And there, just because some of our community members could not come out to speak before the board doesn't mean they weren't deserving of a school. And I'm tired of this argument because, like, we know they needed it. And you are the constituents. I mean, you are the leaders for these constituencies. And you should be stepping up for our people. It doesn't matter how many people come out to speak in front of the board. You knew that it was needed. And then we just, re just because every time it's the excuse, well, our community members didn't come out. We don't know why they couldn't come out or why they couldn't be on Facebook groups or whatever the situation is. We knew that they needed a new school and we just use this excuse all the time. You represent our students. I don't care what side of the county are, where they're on or who, who's able to come out and speak. We knew what they needed and that's just a very poor excuse as a public servant. I'm sorry. So to be clear, only two people who are currently on the board were on the board at that time. And the problem that we have now is that because Patapsco High School got a sizable renovation, they're not well, eligible for funding for a new school for like 15 or 20 years because that renovation and the state rules for um, capital improvements mean that the, a new school for them, for Patapsco now, is problematic because if you were to build a new school, the state will not cover any of the things that were replaced in the renovation and the county would have to cover the cost of that themselves, which would make building a new school prohibitive for the county, which is why the other two schools did not want the renovations and rejected the renovations because they knew if they took the renovations, the renovations would pretty much only replace the HVAC system and leave the other systems alone and in the process of doing that, the renovation would be inadequate and they would be ineligible for funding for a new school for 20 years. So so that's not what we were told. Jackie and I sat with Dr. Dance and Dr. Dance showed us and told us that we are receiving limited renovations and limited renovations would not prevent us from getting a school in the near future. This is what we were told. So you can say you were on the board, but I can tell you what we were told at the time. Jackie and I sat with Dr. Dance he explained that to us that what we were getting was limited renovations and it did not preclude us from then getting a new school and he there's no way he told us 20 years when we had this conversation that is not an accurate set of information that he gave you and you can see the guidelines on the iac website i will look up when at the time when i'll find it from when we were told that i mean because the state regulations aren't something the local board has control over the iac is going to fund based on their regulatory standards and when did the, from what date? What date are those standards? From forever, like some of them are part of Comar and then they oh, create oh, the rest of the regulatory standards that I, it goes back before me. But I know that if a system has been replaced, 
and the school is rebuilt. So like, for instance, Lansdowne High School got $9 million worth of windows put in the school. When Lansdowne High School gets rebuilt, if it's within 20 years of that $9 million worth of windows, the county will have to eat the cost of those windows and not get the 50% state share. So when you have a building that a third of the cost is the HVAC system and electrical, and they replace the HVAC system and electrical, now you're saying that a third of that cost divided by two is not going to be eligible for state funding. And if you replace enough things in a renovation, then that eliminates that amount of money and makes a new school cost prohibitive for the county for the life cycle of those items, which is usually 15 to 20 years. Thank you. Are there any more, any more discussion on this? Hi, this is this is Kathleen Causey. Uh, I just okay. wanted to make a, a comment and um, I understand the frustration that I'm hearing and I think what it one of the things that we need to keep in mind is that the work of board members is very important for board members to really um, evaluate the information that's being provided to us by the school system uh, to make sure that it's uh, sufficient to make the best decision and also that board members that uh, specifically represent a district are really engaged in their community to bring forward the concerns because I agree with uh, Sandy that it shouldn't be up to uh, which community can get to the board meetings uh, etc. It's up to the board to request and insist if necessary on the information the facts uh, that will help guide a good decision. And I think that the work that you all are doing in the area education advisory councils is going to be so important. And I think it's important that uh, the board and the school system provide you with the additional support that you're asking for in terms of communication paths where you can reach your constituents, where you can uh, reach every school. I appreciate uh, Ms. Sibley, you pointing out uh, your concern and that uh, Dr. Williams is following up on it with the transitions in uh, fulfilling recommendations by Public Works, uh, that there will be that direct um, staff member that is going to work with the advisory councils uh, on a regular basis. So um, there's a lot of important work to be done and critical decisions to be made. And uh, one of the things that is the responsibility of the board is to uh, get the information that we need to make the best decisions. And we can, uh, and I'm committed to doing that. And I think that we can all commit to doing that and doing um, a better job. I'd like, excuse me, I'd like to make a comment if possible. Yes, go ahead. Okay. Um, Kathleen Causey, I understand what you're saying as well as what the other board members are saying about uh, the references that you uh, used to make the decisions that you made. But one reference I never heard anyone mention, and that was uh, getting the advice and the recommendations and the desires of the people who put you in office. I'm talking about the young, the people who filled out the survey that was part of the My Pass plan that wanted to make sure or insisted that whatever, whichever way uh, the My Pass decisions were going to be made, that it would be an inclusive and ensuring that it would benefit all children in the schools. Um, when the board makes a decision, regardless of what it is, the decision is supposed to benefit the entire county and not a part of the county. You know, we've heard much about what the politicians had to say about Towson and Delaney. Um, and I'm not going to argue that particular matter, but the bottom line is uh, our county executive did not necessarily agree with what the board decision was. And I think we've already read uh, and understand what he's doing. I'm right now more interested in how the, uh, um, how the uh, in Maryland Interagency Commission on School Construction um, is going to handle this particular matter along with the comments that our county executive shared with them uh, about his feeling uh, about the decisions that were made. Um, we've got to make sure that whether people show up at the board meeting or not, that survey it said something, it said, it said a message to, to us that uh, they're concerned about all, that we should be concerned about all schools, all students. And even if the funding that was available 
and that was recommended, or at least the, pro the programs that were recommended by my past did not have the, the necessary capital uh, funding uh, to make it happen. That, that was already made very clear. So um, I think if I'm not sure if you had any conversations with our county executive about his decision, um, but I think right now it's in the hands of the state, and I believe the state will take in consideration, obviously, what the, the board wanted to see happen. But the bottom line simply is, is that we cannot uh, have any county or any section of the county benefit more so from what little resources we have um, at the expense of the majority of the county. And that's something that is out of here. So I'm, I'm hoping that um, moving forward, that the state will make a decision that will be a well informed decision that will be absent of the politics that unfortunately have been injected into this process. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, one thing I think that I'm sitting here listening to this conversation we have had, and this really brings home how important communication is. I don't think there has been the communication there should have been between the advisory councils and the board. Um, if we are to be true advisors, we should have been doing our part there. And um, that might be something we need to move forward and make sure that we foster more communication both ways from the board to the advisory councils and from the advisory councils to the board. And um, I think this is a true example where there seems to be. There was a lack of communication for many years in many areas. Is there any more discussion on this? If not, I would like to go to each individual council and, and um, they have five minutes each to uh, present to you some major concerns that's just particular to their area. And I don't know whether uh, Tiffany, are you still on the meeting? I know she was going to have to leave. I'm still here. Do you have time that you could present what your council would like us to hear? Donna, can you hear me? I can hear you now. Okay. Yeah, so I'm still here. Good. We can't hear you. I'm sorry, you were, I didn't realize you were ready for me to start. OK, yes. Um, so <laughs> thank you. All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, the two topics I was just going to talk about this evening are not necessarily specific to the Northeast, but I did want to highlight them. Um, we've talked about different things regarding students' education, such as curriculum, closing the academic gap, facilities, et cetera. But for um, this evening, I'd like to use the Northeast time specifically just to speak on the importance of um, our teachers and transportation and our students' education. So uh, for the transportation component, wanted to just speak about um, or advocate for higher wages for our bus drivers, supporting our bus drivers in dealing with safety and student issues, and increased communication between the school, transportation, and parents so that when issues arise with the buses, that information is readily accessible um, to the parents, transportation, and schools. Um, there, is a, there is an initiative, uh, JBO-716-21. Um, Dr. Grimm and I have been talking about that initiative. And so um, the two areas as far as the communication and um, supporting the bus drivers in dealing with the safety and student issues are something that can be addressed with that particular initiative. Um, one of the big things, of course, with transportation, besides just the lack of, of drivers, what comes about is what happens as to our students. So students are waiting at schools or waiting on the bus stops trying to get to school or get back home. And so definitely one of the things with the communication is that uh, as part of this initiative, there is to be um, some type of GPS or tracking so that there's real time um, 
knowledge of where the buses are. So it doesn't necessarily resolve the issues of what's going on fully with transportation, but it does give some source of comfort, at least if a parent is able to know or determine where the bus is or where the student is. So some of those things that are in um, that initiative um, would be dealt, some of the things that I just spoke about would be dealt with that initiative. And then, of course, with our teachers, um, there's a quote that says every child deserve the teacher who believes in them and to be that one. So we definitely have a lot of expectations on our teachers as far as what we expect of them um, and how they are to deal with our children between educating them, nurturing them, instructing them. But I think it's also important that we as a community are there for the teachers as well. And so we want to make sure that our teachers have high morale. We want to make sure that they have opportunities for quality professional development and even opportunities for advancement, as well as appropriate compensation for the teachers and all that they do on behalf of our students, um, because they're just as important to the system as well. If we're looking for teachers to be there for our students, then we need to make sure that we're being there for our teachers and supporting them and what they need. Um, so those were the two items I just wanted to speak on, transportation and teachers, and um, that's it for my time. Thank you. Thank you, Tiffany. Thank you so much. I'd like to now go to um, Marlena Collington Purcell from the Southwest area. Hi, everyone, and good evening once again. I will be quick with mine as well. I'm going to just indicate the top three. Um, of the concerns. Again, it doesn't necessarily um, directly mean that this is only in the Southwest area. This year, specifically, all of the area um, advisory council president chairs has um, come together as one, and we are doing a lot of more collaboration um, because of the trends. And as you know, we're in an abnormal situation when we <laughs> when we have these um, innovative ideas and ways to communicate, we try to make sure that we're not being redundant. So the two for the Southwest, well, three for the Southwest, but again, it relates to all. Um, the first one is the ongoing concern with the lack of ventilation or the HVCA, um, HVAC upgrades, um, sometimes resulting in inadequacies across the schools and leaving it a little bit vulnerable, I guess you would say, in some of the airborne pandemic, um, as the pandemic continues. Um, and when I say in equality, I'm really talking about every school got a pot of money to spend, but in terms of um, whether or not their PTA has joined in or whether or not some other agencies are giving um, more to one school in particular. Um, the second thing is, um, what the long term, what is the long term effect um, or the plan, I would say, to ensure that facilities needs are being met. Um, we often talk about cleaning and we we have um, town halls that indicate that you're ensuring that everything um, that are uh, PP, well, the ESSA grants and monies are being used for are um, being um, put into the school system. We want to make sure and especially, especially in all schools, that it is equitable, that every needs are being met in an equitable sense. And then last but not least, number three, as I said, I was going to be very short. Um, there are um, schools, as you know, if you are looking for a problem, you want to find a problem and we want to be about solutions. Um, so I want to say to you that we do have problems in the southwest area and unfortunately we hear about it on the news or on Facebook or YouTube. And so we want to we want to make sure that um, Channel 45 doesn't blow up <laughs> anymore in the Southwest area than it has in the past. And I say that, you know, being funny, but I really know that we need to work together more in the school systems um, that are in the Southwest area so that problems can be addressed um, in a more um, collaborative way um, so that we can tackle them um, maybe on a front line or a surface before it gets kind of boggled down with other entities and other forces. So those are our three, and I appreciate the time that you have given tonight. And I'd be remiss to add that the Southwest and the Northwest 
we'll be collaborating for our next meeting on Monday, December, um, Monday, 7 o'clock at December 13th. It is online Zoom. You can find the link um, by going to the website and follow, following the Southwest or the Northwest um, Area Advisory. Please attend. It will be a great topic, which of course is the topic of facilities. Come on out. Love to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Marlena. Uh, Cliff, um, we'll go to the Northeast, no, excuse me, Northwest now. And I don't know, uh, I don't know who's going to be speaking. If all of you will be speaking, that's fine. I know you have two vice chairs also. That's true, Donna. I do have my two uh, vice chairs, but I will be the uh, lone speaker for this evening. That's fine. Yeah. It's and take it away. Mm -hmm. I have just one um, concern, recommendation, uh, or if piece of information I'd like to share with uh, the body. I want to thank the board as well as the uh, school system for uh, participating in our meeting. Um, the topic I want to discuss briefly is the need for a career technical high school serving the Northwest area. You know, currently there is no public high school in the Northwest area that is completely dedicated to providing career technical education to BCPS students. The Southeast has three high schools specializing in career technical education. The Southwest, Northeast, and the Central areas have one each. I believe my numbers are correct. They can be confirmed um, through any uh, follow-up best investigation. Pat, uh, Cheryl Pastor, current vice chair of the board, and Arnold Potler, a former member of our Education Advisory Council before his passing, were the original advocates for establishing a high school offering career technical education in the Northwest. Their advocacy began while Joe Hairston was the superintendent of Baltimore County Public Schools and continued after the creation of a Northwest Area Career, the career Technology Task Force. The goal of this task force was to create an effective system of career and technical education and training for students in the Northwest area of Baltimore County. Doug Handy, who at the time was the Director of Career and Technology Education and Fine Arts, gave a presentation about the task force at a public meeting hosted by the Northwest Area Education Advisory Council. Later that year, the task force presented at its last meeting a list of recommendations for suggested guidance or steps that could be taken by the BCPS to lay the foundations for implementation of CTE programs that would be accessible. I underscore the word accessible for all students in the Northwest area. Some of the CTE programs recommended by the task force were implemented in area high schools. However, our primary goal continues to be establishment of a building that can accommodate a variety of CTE programs, most of whom were recommended by the businesses and industries serving on the task force and who were, by the way, located in the Northwest area. I say all this to say that this has been a long standing request that the school system, the board, as well as the school system itself consider uh, the possibility of de developing, building, um, identifying a building that can accommodate uh, a variety of CTE programs. Um, it's my understanding that there are maybe two locations uh, within the South Northwest area that can accommodate such a, such a, a school. Uh, it's long. It's a long time uh, coming. It may be a long time before it becomes a reality, uh, but that reality uh, can be nurtured by starting to do some uh, fearless research and investigation on how we can make that happen on behalf of the students and the communities at large in the Northwest area. So I, I would like to recommend to both the board uh, and the school system to uh, uh, dedicate some time and effort to see, uh, even though we're in the midst of uh, limited resources, uh, but at least use this time to really study how we can create a school within Baltimore County, Northwest area in particular, that will be accessible uh, to the students living in that count in that part of the county. Thank you very much. Thank you, Cliff. Uh, Dr. Ferone or you are you? Dr. Ferone, are you there? Uh, 
Yuri, who is the Yuri chair, the vice chair. OK, uh, I then am going to go. Um, that would be the central. Uh, I guess they weren't able to get in as presenters. And last Anna, but not least, uh, yes. Excuse me, this is Tracy. Dr. Fern is calling in, but I'm not sure if he's able to get off mute. OK. Well, let me let's go to um, the southeast. Jackie uh, Brewster and Sandy Scordalis. I don't know which one of you or if you're going to share. Your concerns. Jackie or Sandy? It's my understanding that Jackie was supposed to be speaking. Okay. Um, Sandy, I'm fine if you want to speak. Uh, I'm good. I've said my piece. Thank you. <laughs> and and I, I, I kind of feel the same way. The only um, the only other I, I agree with Clifford that he needs a um, a career in tech school. So we have one in in, in the southeast Sollers Sollers Dundalk, which is is a, a beautiful school. And um, in the central area, they have Carver, which is a, a beautiful school and the northwest deserves that as well. But I would even go as far to say that the um, the other areas deserve the same type of new building as well. The only other issues that um, that have come up in the in the in the southeast is um, I, um, I'm hearing an awful lot about the trouble that children are having trying to um, to bridge the gap from when they left um, due to COVID. And so I would like to know what what we're really doing because just saying that teachers are going to be able to fill that gap in when there's such a limited amount of time in a school day is, is not the answer. So I would like to know really how that is how those children are going to be caught up. Um, like many of the fourth graders seem to be stuck in second grade. So I would like to know how that is is being filled in. And then, of course, behavior. And I, I understand that um, students were out for a while and that it's hard to get them adjusted to being back into um, a classroom. However, we're, we're now heading towards Christmas time and by this time things should be settled, but we're still having issues. Would anyone uh like to address that from Dr. Williams or the board? Okay. Good, good evening, everyone. This is Mildred Charlie Green, Chief of Staff. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to join you and you. Um, I would um, just like to just just put a quick plug in for our upcoming zone area town halls as well as uh, as an opportunity to have zone uh, wide or zone uh, specific conversations about steps that we would like to take collaboratively with school communities as well as with families uh, to ensure that we are putting in place things to address behavior issues and concerns that we've seen. I'd also like to point to Dr. Williams letter of last week where we outlined some specific initiatives um, involving various members of our community. Dr. Williams, who was on the call earlier and who is listening in, is currently meeting with our students. Uh, he's meeting with the executive board of the student councils, and part of their work is to put in place a mental health awareness campaign as well as safety campaigns for the remainder of the year to really speak directly to their peers about the environment that they need and deserve and their role in helping to ensure that. So I think it's a multi-pronged effort. Uh, we are certainly open and desirous of conversations with every member of our community related to this. I would just invite you to please join us in these towns. I, I think you froze at the oh, end, but I thank you so much. Oh, thank you. No problem. Thank you. We have just a couple of minutes left. Is there anyone on the board that has any questions, would like to make any more comments? Uh, I don't know, Dr. Ferone, did you ever, were you ever able to 
call in. Donna, while you're waiting for Dr. Ferrone, um, I would like to, um, I am on the curriculum committee yes. and I couldn't go back and get the exact date, but it's been within the last three meetings. Um, Dr. Mary McComas and her team did provide a pretty comprehensive look at acknowledging number one, that we do have children with significant gaps. And the example that was given is that we have fourth graders with second grade knowledge is a very valid one. And uh, there was a very long presentation during that meeting talking about specifically what we are trying to do to bridge those gaps. There's, there was some discussion about um, acceleration and what that means in relationship to not accelerating like to GT, but accelerating learning because we are trying to make up for a lot of lost learning in a short period of time. Um, I, I think it will provide some useful information and I will acknowledge even if you watch that presentation that you will have additional questions, but that presentation is a good presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate you lending that information to us. Thank you. Donna, I am on. I don't know if you can hear me. This is Bash Farron. Yes, yes. Thank you, Dr. Farron. You're welcome. You may. Oh, OK. Um, I, I truly congratulate the uh, uh, teacher of uh, Woman Hen and Miss Pastor on their election, and I'll keep it brief. Um, my concern and my council concern are um, the same as other uh, councils, uh, but for us really, I would like to stress about communication. Um, I noticed that uh, when I or maybe some others would send emails uh, uh, to school officials that uh, either there would be no answer and I truly understand the amount of load of communication in email on uh, all the supportive staff in the school system, the teachers, all of them. I myself, I have like 500 emails in my inbox. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, we are, we are the ambassadors to the community, uh, from the board to the community. We are like your arm to communicate with our community in the central area. And I, I truly appreciate if we can have some sort of uh, understanding that if something really comes uh, in the form of question or concern that at least the official in the school system would acknowledge the receipt of uh, that communication. Um, the other part that is, I think, personally uh, important for the central area uh, is the funding. And I know I asked for that in the Board of Education, but um, everybody here today is stressed about communication. Our communication in the central area uh, is two way. One is the community itself, and one is the Board of Education. The Board of Education is relatively easy. I come in and I speak to you. I write my report. I give it to you. But to be able to communicate with the parents in the central area, somehow the chair or the council has to have access to those. And, and that makes it so difficult to reach out to people uh, and to gauge their happiness with the school system or their uh, concerns. It does require money. Uh, I do ask the administration to consider some sort of help uh, for us so we can carry that uh, function. Uh, one of the functions about communication is really the monthly meeting that we do or we try to do. And uh, it has been difficult to reserve for facilities. Uh, we had two members spending several hours on that. So somehow that system needs to be stress free because all of us truly are working in daytime. 
Um, you know, we can't really sit for hours to reserve a space for a conference next month or the month after that. And uh, to make it easier on us, and, and that reservation means that we can devote the time and effort towards better communication uh, with, with the public that uh, we represent. The last, but not really least, uh, I just want to echo what I personally believe uh, the most important question that came in our last meeting from uh, my friend and my colleague, uh, uh, Jackie Brewster. Um, Jackie asked in the last meeting, what can we do to help you, the Board of Education? I basically want to renew that not only for the board, but also for administration. Because for instance, my council is about 10 members. I think every council has somewhere between five to 10. So if you count all of us as volunteers, we are at least 25 and we could be probably more like 35, maybe 40 uh, dedicated volunteers trying to help the school system. And if we know what the school needs help with, the board needs help with, it would be much easier on us to try to fulfill that uh, function and really truly help you doing your job, whether it is the board or uh, uh, administration. Um, I, I, I am dedicated as you've seen me. I know there are several members in my council who really put quite a bit of time and I just really want to make sure that we are effective in the way you see that it would help the issue of education. And we stand to help you in whichever way you ask of us. I thank you again for coming today and allowing me to speak. Thank you very much, Dr. Brown. Uh, and I thank all of you for coming. Um, I don't want to go over time. I think we're, we've got about three minutes, but I won't take that. I just want to uh, wish everyone happy holidays, uh, celebrating whatever religion and holiday you observe. A happy and healthy 2022. Uh, stay safe. And our next meeting is scheduled for April 27th, 2022. And I hope that we will not have any more problems, that some of the pandemic will be further away than it is now. And uh, again, thank you so very much for all of you giving your time tonight to meet with us. And again, sharing everything that you shared. It, the communication is key, and I really appreciate the fact that you shared it with us. And good night. Thank you all. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank You're you. Welcome. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Happy holidays. Okay.